I'd like to welcome today Jody Lowich and Eric Strom. Jody is the Chief Marketing Officer of Rural Solutions, and Eric Strom is the uh, Director of uh, Channel Development at GoZone Wi-Fi. And um, I'm thrilled to have them uh, uh, present today. And this is a, a follow-up, uh, almost a sequel to the other meeting that we had. So I'm excited to see uh, how this, uh, learn more about this topic and see how it can benefit uh, food trucks and other outdoor venues. So thank you, Jody, and thank you, Eric, for presenting today. And welcome, Jody, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thanks a lot, <clears throat> everybody, for being here today. As Simeon mentioned, this is kind of a part two to a webinar we gave two weeks ago on March 30th. We're gonna recap a little bit of information from that and then go into this more specific area of how Wi-Fi marketing can be installed, used and leveraged for businesses that are food trucks, outdoor venues, um, including parks, campgrounds, um, all of those places where you actually struggle to either get data or Wi-Fi. So I'm going to share my screen and start here. And I'm just going to minimize that. Okay. So we're supposed to go from the beginning. Come on. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So we want to thank, first of all, the CBOEO for sponsoring us um, once again and working with us to do this. Um, Rural Solutions here in Vermont is a one-stop shop for small businesses. We are huge small business champions, and our job is to help small businesses be as successful as possible. Um, and we're lucky enough to have our partner GoZone here today, Eric Strom, uh, who's going to kind of do a one-two with me on this and let's get going. So our topic today is we're gonna quickly talk about what is Wi-Fi marketing? How does it work? And then we're gonna get a little bit more specific. How does Wi-Fi marketing benefit food trucks and outdoor venues like campgrounds, vineyards and parks? How do you add Wi-Fi marketing to your operation? Because I think that's one of the biggest questions that we both, but both Eric and I hear when you're talking about adding Wi-Fi marketing to a business that isn't a brick and mortar. Um, and then getting into the cost, what is, what are you realistically looking at? Um, and what does the system do? What are you getting back for that, for that investment? Okay, so Wi-Fi marketing and I'm talking to the people up here in Vermont, if you've ever gone to, you know, Longhorn or Chili's or like, it's not just Vermont because that's their national chains. If you've ever gone to a restaurant, a library, and you get a pop-up that says, hey, there's, there's free Wi-Fi here. You just have to log in. That's essentially Wi-Fi marketing, especially when you're doing it at a retail spot, like a restaurant or a, st or a store. Um, so talking on the technical side, it's when retailers or other public venue operators provide wireless internet access to guests, and then they're capturing that information and then using it to communicate, you know, messages, branding, promotions, all of it. Um, one of the things that I really like as a marketer about Wi-Fi marketing is that it's a really uninvasive way of capturing critical information. So it involves the use of a, a simple software that's the actual goes on platform. And it's just leveraging an existing or you know, a new one. We'll talk a little bit more about the actual network, the physical network, and offering that as a courtesy service, which at this point, many people expect to have that available to them. So the personal information is collected and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but if you look at the welcome screen on the phone to the right of the copy in the slide, you can see that connect with Facebook, connect with Instagram, connect with Twitter, Twitter LinkedIn, do it with an email, SMS, 
the reason that that list is there in the graphic is because as the owner of the Wi-Fi system, you have the ability to determine how you want to collect that information. Maybe you don't want to do Facebook. Maybe you just want to do email. Maybe you just want to do SMS. Maybe you want to do all of it. It's up to you. And that's one of the nice things, the, the, the flexibility aspect of marketing this way. Um, and then lastly, the data analytics help inform you on the, you know, not only do you collect this really golden group of data that you can use for campaigns, you can then use the analytics, you know, let's say you're in a food truck and you want to see location-wise where you're getting the most online traffic. And that data is so important because it's informing you on multiple levels about your audience. So how does it work? We've been touching on this, but this is a little bit about physically how it works. So the Wi-Fi network, the guest Wi-Fi network is offered, you know, to patrons slash users to use while they're within a certain boundary of where you are. If you're a food truck, it's going to go out based on the equipment. And I'm sure Eric can talk a little bit more about that. And I'm going to have him do that once I get through this. <laughs> um, you know, I guess connects, as you can see in the cadence here. Um, this isn't the exact cadence. You can choose how that works. But guests are presented with a welcome screen. They can be uh, welcomed with a splash page that can do any number of things. It can promote you, your business. It can promote another business. Um, you can do quizzes on there. You can, if you're, let's say you're a food truck and you wanna put the list of your, you know, where you're gonna be for the next week. Let's say you're a venue and you have a list of events. You can put that on that splash page so that people see that before they're, you know, right as they're getting connected to that safe, secure Wi-Fi. Um, on the technical side, the contact information provided by the guest is validated, which is so important because if it's, it, it, once it's authenticated, that means you have a real contact in there. Um, it's a really good filter for, for, you know, keeping out sort of the nonsense stuff or, you know, emails that aren't real, that kind of thing. Um, and then lastly, it really depends on which login that they use, but, you know, you can, not only are you getting the basic information that is necessary to build that audience, you can find out about device IDs, how long they were on, etc. cetera. Um, so Eric, what did I miss here? <laughs> you just get unmuted. Can you hear me okay now? Yep. Perfect. Uh, I don't really think you missed anything. There might be a couple of things that, that I just kind of wanted to add. Jody, you had mentioned um, how it, it's almost an expectation of many businesses, and, and I just wanted to call that out. You're absolutely right. Uh, research has shown in many different industries that it's an absolute expectation when choosing a restaurant or depending on the the industry um, that they have Wi-Fi access. So um, it, it's really come to be expected. And yep. I think the, the marketing for Wi-Fi side of this, do the marketing, as a business, you're providing a service. It's an expectation, but it's not giving you anything back <laughs> in, unless you activate this. And, and, and that's where the, this marketing to Wi-Fi comes in. Um, you have an expense of offering a service and by just a few couple of screens, like the welcome screen you hear, see here, you're collecting some information and you're engaging that, that uh, guest or that client. And you're not only engaging them while you're in the restaurant or while you're outside the food truck um, you know, enjoying the meal, you're engaging with them at some point in the future, depending on what information you collect. Here we're collecting an email address. So you may send out an email campaign at a later date. So that message is getting in their home or an SMS text message campaign. Again, it could be one minute after they log in, it could be after their fourth visit, or it could be you know next Thursday when they're at home or at work. So um, I think 
if you look at it that way, it's really just trying to maximize benefit that the business receives from a service that they're paying for and offering. Great, thank you, Eric. So here are some unique marketing challenges we have facing food trucks. To be honest, this is applicable to you know, outdoor venues that particularly in Vermont are only open, let's say from May through October. Um, you know, and, and same with campgrounds and parks. I mean, just we live in a wintry state. So, you know, and the flip side is that you, you have skiing and winter sports, and then that sort of closes down. So the inconsistency of customers um, is a real, is, is an absolute challenge facing food trucks and outdoor venues and outdoor recreation spaces. You can't always depend on returning customers the same way a brick and mortar can. Um, as with every business, food trucks and outdoor venues, we're a small business state like so many are. And as small business owners, you're doing everything. So marketing tends to fall to the bottom of the list when it should be within the top three, if not the top two. Awareness of differing locations. Again, this is pretty specific to food truck owners, but you know, let's say you have a wine and beer festival that's gonna move to different spots throughout a state. It's imperative to let people know where you're going to be, even if you're on a set route, but especially if, if you go a handful of different places at different times where it's not a set route. Um, or again, you are doing events and you need that list present in front of people on their radar screen all the time so that you're getting the attendance that you want. And lastly, you know, every business has a challenge of what brand awareness, but when you sort of have a moving target, <laughs> like a food truck or an outdoor venue that again may only be seasonal, it's really about keeping top of mind for people, maybe even during the off season. You know, it's about triggering in January the list of your upcoming events that are going to start in May. And people may be saying, well, that's really early. That's the whole point. You have to start thinking you should always be doing your marketing. I like two quarters ahead, but at least a minimum of a quarter ahead. And again, when you've collected this information from your Wi-Fi network, you have the ability to do that outreach and, and get that traction going. Eric, do you have any, uh, anything to add? I do actually, um, you know, this, this whole slide and, and the portion here is talking about the unique uh, challenges of food trucks, but really I wanna point out there's also a, a unique window in time. You know, there's an opportunity window that's open now. Um, we've already said that uh, restaurants and food businesses, there's an expectation of having Wi-Fi. Not quite there yet for food trucks um, because not that many food trucks are uh, set up with Wi-Fi today. That's why I say there's an opportunity. If you go to an event and there are six food trucks set up and you're the one with Wi-Fi, right. let me tell you, <laughs> you're you're right where you want to be. So this window is closing. Um, in our business, uh, we get contacted regularly by um, food truck operators and how do we do this and going about it. So there's a window now, whether you operate that food truck or you work with clients that have food trucks, that window is today. And, and the second thing, I'm just gonna slide this in there. It's it's kind of a marketing tactic, but um, no, Eric, we lost you a little bit. Uh, I think you're cutting out a little bit. Move it better, look, you wanna go ahead. Jody, you want to go ahead and I'll just move to a different location? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Um, it, you know, I actually have a story about this. We have a client who he does events and what he brings to events are 
you know, these very cool new photo booths, they're open photo booths. Um, and he has the crazy sort of 360 video machine where you and your friends stand on this podium and the camera goes around you and does a 360. And he brought one, he brought his equipment to a bridal show at the end of this January. And it was at a pretty big venue up here in Burlington. And the way his system is set up is that once the picture or video is taken, it immediately gets sent to the participant's phone so that they can then blast it out. It's actually really cool. Unfortunately, the venue where he was had pretty terrible free Wi-Fi. It was way too low. So he couldn't, the whole SMS portion of his business wasn't working. He wound up having to email people the pictures and the videos after the event. So he lost so much impact from that. And really what we're talking to him about is him creating himself as a hotspot, really very similar to, you know, a food truck or it's an outdoor venue type of situation so that he doesn't have to worry about not having enough power you know, enough internet wattage to get that information, the data from the, his equipment to people, because that's really the cool aspect of it. You get this picture instantly and you get to snap it out or Instagram it out to your friends. So that was, you know, that's one way we're really looking at this to support businesses. Jody, can you hear me any better now? I can. Okay, so I, just the, the point that I wanted to make while we're selling the benefits with the food truck, from, and I said it's from a guerrilla marketing uh, point of view, but if you're in a group of food trucks um, and you're one of them that's broadcasting, the others aren't, you're collecting contact information and your message is getting out to those clients and customers that are nearby, not necessarily standing right in front of your truck as well. So it's a trick that has been used by the brick and mortar businesses and restaurants for years, uh, but in the food truck, uh, particularly because there's so many gatherings, whether where there are multiple food trucks, right? It works so well in this business. And, you know, wouldn't you like your message to get out to all those other trucks too, so they can follow your food truck and not just the one they're used to. Right, yep, exactly. It actually makes me think of, we have a beautiful park up here. We have a lot of beautiful parks, but the one that I go to when I go to the beach is called Letty Park. and. Um, from Memorial Day weekend through Labor Day weekend, every Wednesday, or hopefully they're going to do it again, they have food truck night. And at this point, there's probably nine or 10 food trucks. And the, my cell phone barely works there because it's one of those where you want to snap the picture of the food because these are like high end gourmet food trucks. They're del the food that comes out of them is just delicious. Um, but the date is terrible. So that's, you know, that's certainly one place where I think about it. Um, so to talk about the benefits of Wi-Fi marketing for food trucks and outdoor spaces, as I've mentioned before, it's, it's unintrusive critical data collection um, for your social and email marketing. As Eric mentioned, you, you kind of have to think out of the box a little bit when you're marketing food trucks or outdoor venues simply because you don't have that brick and mortar. Um, you know, you're, you're not going to run a TV ad. You're probably not going to run a print ad. Those, those outlets, those kind of channels aren't going to work great for you. You're gathering your audience as people are literally coming to your truck or your venue. So it's even more important to, to collect that data. And when you're offering a courtesy service, like safe, secure, free Wi-Fi, because this is safe and secure. And I'll talk a little bit about that and, and Eric will too. When you're offering that, it's not a lot to ask in exchange for an email. The second um, point is once you, you've started to collect that, you can drive sales with targeted and personalized marketing campaigns. GoZone has a whole dashboard. So that integration, there's so much happening behind the scenes technically where essentially all of this stuff that's happening, you don't have to touch. Um, you, you can, along with somebody like myself, you would be looking at that data and going, oh, okay, Wednesdays, 
our really hot day. So maybe it's, you know, come between five and seven and get a free soda with every order over $10. You know, it's looking at that data and really determining how to target it and, and make it work. Um, again, you're building customer lists, you're getting that detailed information. And as Eric was just talking about before, you can attract nearby guests with branded Wi-Fi. You know, maybe that person didn't visit your food truck, but the fact that they're able to get online safely and securely with the Wi-Fi coming from your food truck, it is going to keep you in mind, hands down. Um, the platform has the ability to do SMS campaigns, which for, again, outdoor venues and food trucks, I think is really effective marketing. You know, you can send out an SMS saying, hey, we're going to be in downtown Burlington. We're going to be down at the Echo on Friday by 11. Um, venues, hey, this weekend, we've got our wine festival coming up. Make sure you get your tickets here. It's those kinds of reminders that go, oh, right, that's what I want to do this weekend. Social follow-up. I mean, social media is so critical. I mean, it's critical for everybody. It's my mantra. And when I say social, I'm talking about organic social media. But with the information that you're gathering, it just gives you so much more ability to brainstorm and create around that. What are you going to post? What do people want to see? Obviously, food is a big one, taking great pictures of that, but there's so much more to it. Where are you getting your food from? Do you want to talk about your local partners? All of that stuff. Um, and then lastly, going to the security, the way that you know a, a real Wi-Fi marketing platform works is that it takes that group of people who are signing on, puts them in a safe, secure bubble that's away from your other stuff, right? So, you know, they can't get onto your QuickBooks. <laughs> they can't get into your Square device, but also they're protected from hackers or, you know, having their information leaked out where they don't want to go. And I think that that is so important. Um, I can tell you that our tech division here at Rural Solutions, over March, the, the, they've been going out at least once a week on a data breach. And many of them have been from Russian IPs. Um, one actually got into the company's QuickBooks. So, you know, having that secure network, especially when you're having so many transactions potentially go over a Wi-Fi system is essential. Eric, do you have um, something to add? Sure, thank you. Um, device isolation is, is what we call it. And we'll, I'm gonna not get very technical, but Jody described it perfectly. It's, it's kind of the opposite of what you see in your home. Right. If you have a, a cable modem or Wi-Fi in your home and you have a printer and you set up that printer and on the printer, it says, is this visible on the network? Meaning from my laptop, can I print to my printer? And for my cell phone, can I print to my printer? All those things you do from the Wi-Fi. That is the opposite of what we have here. <laughs> so with device isolation, you can't see any other devices. It's a tunnel that's all the way back to the router and then out to the internet. So from my device connected to guest Wi-Fi, I can only get out to the internet. And frankly, in the early days when we were showing this product to restaurants, we would awfully, often go into a brick and mortar restaurant and open a laptop and connect to their Wi-Fi. Typically we'd ask the password because they would often have a password they didn't change for six months. And uh, we'd show them their printer. We'd show for the, the line, we'd show them their, their cash register, the point of sale system on the network. And it was a, an easy way to demonstrate to them how they needed <laughs> Wi-Fi with device isolation. So ours is built in. It's not something you have to worry about. So if you have any questions about that, my contact information you get from Jody, I'll be happy to explain it. But um, it's important and uh, it was very effective. The other thing, uh, starting at the, the top list where uh, Jody had mentioned about being unintrusive, 
Um, the little collection screens that you saw with Facebook and email and SMS, you can make that as detailed or as simple as you like for your business. And different businesses have different models. Um, we typically recommend as a best practice to make the sign-in very simple, not too many choices. Um, keep it quick so people can sign on and get to the internet and do what they want to do. We have other clients where it's more of a captive audience. Um, some of our large casino clients but with very large casinos have very poor and non-existent cell service within the casino facility. Um, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, of oh, the casino, oh, yeah. yeah. So they ask a lot of questions. They have multiple screens. Have you been here before? Are you a member of our players club? Do you come on Tuesdays? And then they collect a lot of data with the service we have here because the guest is willing to exchange that information for access. If you're in a food truck or a restaurant or brick, no, you want to connect, get them out, but you want it to be useful data. So um, it can be as unobtrusive um, or as detailed depending on your business allows. That's the one thing I want to point out really. Great, thanks, Eric. And just some additional benefits. Um, Wi-Fi marketing is one of the least expensive ways to collect critical data about your customers, focus groups, phone surveys. Those things cost a, quite a bit of money. Um, Wi-Fi marketing really does come down to pennies on the dollar. Uh, DeviceScape did a survey a couple of years ago um, that found half of businesses report that customers spend more money when they have Wi-Fi marketing. And it makes sense because quite frankly, they're hanging around. They're not getting frustrated by the fact that they can't text with their friends, you know, check what's going on, make a phone call. That's not happening because they have, their phone is doing what they want it to do. So they're happy to hang out. Um, as we've mentioned, it's really easy to remarket to guests. It's really about marketing to guests um, because there's just, there's multiple channels with API integrations. The data is all there, can be exported. It's very easy to review and go through. This is the one I really uh, like about for the outdoor venues and food trucks is drive revenue by collecting payments or vouchers for premium Wi-Fi access. Um, this is really, to me, more about those campgrounds. It, another little story, my dad and my stepmom came up June 21 to see my daughter graduate and they did the, the whole crazy RV thing. <laughs> um, they were up here for 10 days. They were over in the North Beach State Park which is beautiful. I definitely highly recommend it. However, my dad is pretty frugal and he does consumer cellular. Typically because for the most part, they stay on the monthly, I don't even know, I think it's like $25 for the plan or something. Because the campground didn't have any Wi-Fi at all, for my dad to watch his baseball games and my stepmom to play her games, um, online, they blew through all of their data for the month in 10 days, which I thought was really funny. Um, but it's because the campground didn't have anything to access. There was nothing. It was strictly just by data. I think you could do satellite, but on the size RV they had, they didn't, they didn't have a satellite. So there's a lot to work with there. Um, the platform allows you to do things like coupons, um, again, the demographics really help you understand your audience. And if you are in a place like a campground and you want to control the usage, there are tools to limit session times and, and bandwidth. Um, I remember my, I had my former clients were over at New Moon Cafe, which is a big favorite of the UVM students. And the, the restaurants sort of had a love-hate relationship with that, specific, really around exam time, because they have free Wi-Fi. They're not getting anything for it, at least then they didn't. And they'd have college kids come in, order a coffee, and then sit at a table for five hours with their friends while they did a study group. Um, if the Wi-Fi had been controlled with session timing, 
you know, they wouldn't have had people camping out quite the same way. Um, so that's really what that's all about. And lastly, you own your own data. And for us, I mean, at Rural Solutions, you always own your own creative. So that pool of data that you're collecting, I mean, that's, that's yours. That doesn't, we don't do anything with it other than help you figure out how to market with it best. But that's really important, especially as you build your business. Eric, do you have sure. anything to add? Sure, Joe, if I can just uh, step on that uh, one more time, make it very plain. You own the data. We don't own the data. Uh, Rural Solutions doesn't, it, it's your data. And that's very important. Um, so we don't do anything with it, but we want you to know that uh, we can show you how to use it. And uh, just at the top of the list there, uh, Jody had mentioned about the inexpensive way to, to advertise. We haven't talked much about the campaigns yet, but within our dashboard, you can set up triggered or we call them smart campaigns, whether they're email campaigns or SMS uh, messaging campaigns that are triggered by guest behavior. So oftentimes in a restaurant, you may send out a message five minutes after they are first there. Um, hey, thanks for coming in. Let us know if you need anything, whatever that message is. Um, I would send one 24 hours after their visit as kind of soliciting feedback. No, nope, we lost you again, Eric. Okay. Um, oh, you're back. So you build those campaigns once. Yeah, it says I have an unstable connection. So do you want to go on to the next slide and I'll just... Uh, okay. I can fix it. Thank you. Okay, so the big question, how do you add, physically add Wi-Fi marketing to your enterprise? Um, and this is, I'll talk a little bit about this, but then I'm definitely passing this over to Eric. <laughs> um, for food trucks, it's about having, you know, the right technology, which is not that difficult, um, and being able to send that um, that signal out. So Eric, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Eric, you there? Yes, can you, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay, yes. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, this is the fun part. And I'm, I won't get too much in the weeds. If I do, Jody, just uh, tap me and tell me it's it's too much. But okay. um, basically, um, the, the LTE device is, is simply uh, a form of router like you have in your home. But this one is, is receiving the signal from the cell service. So as long as the area you're in has cell service, you can receive the internet. Because in order to broadcast Wi-Fi, you need two things, a power source and you need an internet connection. And as long as you um, have one of the devices that is set up for cell phone service, you can plug it into a 12 volt solution. So it could be part of the food truck itself or if you have power where you are. Um, and that's basically how the that part of it works. Once you have the unit up and broadcasting, it could be on top of the truck or through one of the windows. Um, one unit would typically support between 30 to 50 concurrent users. That's a lot of people to be online at the same time around one food truck. So um, the nice thing is that one device is going to allow your truck to uh, market to people nearby as well. Um, and we talked earlier about the session and control uh, and with Jody had kind of touched on that. But in the example she gave of, of uh, was it um, the, the cafe we had all the students um, yeah. Our dashboard is um, designed for a lot of different businesses and a lot of different verticals. So uh, once we know the pain point that you're having, we can help you address that. So we have um, coffee shops and cafes, particularly um, over in the UK. Uh, they're a little more used to the coupon method. So when you buy your coffee or your Danish, you get a, a voucher for 15 minutes internet. And when that's up, you can buy something else. You can control that time limit. Um, it could be 15 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever you want. And it could be done on a voucher basis. That model is not as prevalent here in the States, but it could simply be the session limit is going to time you out after 30 minutes. So that then you have to log back in, go through the authentication process. Um, and you could also say, no, you only get 30 minutes in a day. Now, all that um, level of control um, you can set in our dashboard and we would work with you um, as a best practice, what works for your business and uh, what makes sense. The other thing about bandwidth 
um, when you think about at your home use, when you, you ask a question, am I, am I paying too much? Am I, do I not have enough bandwidth? Kind of the same question comes up with um, Wi-Fi in a business. You are paying for X amount of bandwidth and you want it to be efficiently used as possible. If you have four people sit at a table and they're all streaming videos on their device, that's going to take a lot of bandwidth. So typically for many of our restaurants, we will throttle down that speed per device so that they're not watching live videos. It's enough to do their banking or emails or access websites, but not enough to uh, do the live streaming. And that way you can get more people with better access with the same amount of bandwidth you have. The other part of with the uh, bandwidth controls is that you can choose the time. So if your business in a campground, you wouldn't uh, worry about this, but if you had a business that was only open you know, from eight in the morning till five at night, you could set the system to only broadcast during that time frame, and it wouldn't broadcast during any other time. It's more of a security issue. We're in a brick and mortar situation. We have a lot of businesses that have rental space, maybe on the second floor above or next to them, and they don't want those people using the free Wi-Fi. So all that can be set in our dashboard. Um, Jody, was there anything else about any of these particular points that you think I should mention? Um, I guess, you know, I would talk to, if you're using the cell phone technology, how does that affect your data plan, if it, if it does at all? Good question. So um, to use an LTE device, which is a cell, cell phone powered device, it's a, a SIM chip that you get from your cell phone provider. So you would talk to T-Mobile, whoever it is, and they have different plans designed specifically for business. Just tell them what it is you're going to be doing, and they will make a recommendation on what plan that chip is on. So that chip will typically, almost always, on a different plan than you have for your normal cell phone. Because it's a business expense. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So moving to campgrounds and other outdoor venues, um, again, I'm going to pass this over to Eric, because it is a little bit different. The one thing I will add is that rural solutions, I mean, we have a tech division. So for um, a physical outdoor place, you would need an assessment done. Um, you know, if you're looking to be at a hundred feet, a thousand feet, because there's going to have to be the routers, the access points placed so that your signal is as strong as you want it to be. Um, Eric, take it away. Great, thank you. So um, at GoZone, we, we are in any vertical business that, that you can think of. Um, uh, many, many, many years ago, our, our first installation was actually in an airport uh, where you could get commercially available Wi-Fi in an airport. Um, so we have learned um, at different venues require different um, challenges and, and solutions. So the site survey is very important. That's what Jody mentioned. If you have a, a restaurant or a food, you know, if the food truck, it's pretty much going to be one device needed, typically, unless you're really trying to capture a lot of traffic surrounding, you know, a brick and mortar restaurant with, you know, 20, 30 tables, probably going to be one access point, maybe two. That's pretty simple. But when you get to a campground, um, you know, it changes. Um, I managed a 100 acre campground here in Florida uh, for a period of time. And, and it was quite the challenge to lay out the, the radios and access points. So I'm not the technical one that does that. And Dodi isn't either, I don't think. But we have a, a teams that, that do that. And there are things that you don't necessarily think about. Uh, the density of foliage, for instance, the, the, the green leaves and trees suck up the Wi-Fi signal and are a barrier that you wouldn't think about necessarily. Uh, but at a campground, it's really important. So uh, I just want to mention that you don't need to know this, but there are a variety of types of antennas, shapes of antennas. Uh, they can broadcast point to point. We can, we can beam things to a very specific location. Um, so let somebody that does that for a living do that. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's what they're good at. Um, if you have a, a campground or, or any meeting area, it could be a, um, you know, a concert where you do concerts in a, in a green space or maybe do art shows uh, in a green space. Um, 
this solution for Wi-Fi is really um, extra effective if there's poor cell phone service. I mentioned the casino uh, client that we work with. Um, if, if the cell service is bad, everybody's looking for Wi-Fi. Um, and if the Wi-Fi is particularly good and strong, many people will opt for the Wi-Fi calling to save on their uh, cell plan, like consumer cell care, if you're, if you're paying by the minute. So um, <laughs> it, it's an advantage to you if the cell service is bad, um, but it's, it's a benefit as long as you are offering good Wi-Fi service. So the right uh, equipment in the right places and the right amount of bandwidth, that's an extra advantage. So oh, Jody had mentioned earlier about the, the paid services. So uh, it, it's as simple as a, a camper um, pulls out their phone or laptop, um, selects a Wi-Fi network, um, which you name, and we'll have some recommendations for you on that. And typically it's a top choice. They click on it, presents them a screen that shows you those login screens we showed earlier. Are they logging in with their email, et cetera? Or it could be, hi, we have free access today. If you're looking for premium access that's faster bandwidth or um, a longer duration, you can pay for that service. Click here. They present their payment information. Money is collected uh, through your payment processor and deposited into your account. Um, it's all done seamlessly, and then the guest is given access. One of the cool things for uh, campgrounds or any uh, seasonal um, activity, like I said, a, a concert uh, grounds or uh, like a fairgrounds, anywhere that there's a, a multi-purpose events outdoors is that um, you can offer seasonal plans. So a campground may offer a five hour plan, a weekend plan, weekly, or even seasonal. What we have seen is just an explosion in growth in outdoor campgrounds um, utilizing this service, particularly since we've reopened since COVID um, and not just in the U.S. I'm, I'm dealing uh, with campgrounds in other countries. I have a large campground in the Netherlands right now that's uh, just deploying the service, um, and they're thrilled to be able to offer the plants and collect um, remotely, right, from the, the phone. In the past, they'd have to go to the camp store and uh, pay for um, a lot of little access code, and it was very limited, so this is a lot easier, and we want to make it as simple for the campground staff as possible. Um, and it talks about that with the custom plans. I pretty much covered that. Um, if you didn't want payment uh, through credit card, you could also do vouchers where you can issue or sell those vouchers. Some of our campgrounds um, issue a voucher with a seasonal. So when they pay for their seasons uh, site for the year or for the season, they get a voucher worth X. And something that's pretty new, um, uh, is great for campgrounds called Secure Pass. And typically with um, a captive portal solution like we've been talking about so far, and that's simply where a guest looks at a screen, a splash screen and signs on. Um, they give some information and then they click connect and they're on. There's an alternative here that, that's um, really very helpful for campgrounds. And that's with Secure Pass, you can actually issue a username and password. And you know, you first hear that and you're like, well, why would that be important? Well. If I'm, I grew up camping and we would go to uh, this, this uh, campground out in the islands of Lake Erie every year, every summer. And um, there, there were a lot of us, <laughs> you know, that, that would go. So you wouldn't want just a plan that has only one device access. So with Secure Pass, you can enumerate the number of devices. You can say this is good for five devices, eight devices, and whatever works in your market. And you also issue a username and password. So the parent signs up for the plan, gets the username and can give it to the, the kids, any guests as they see fit, fit or not. So there's a control element there. But the other part of it is if you have minor children in the campground, you may not want them logging in by presenting credentials like their email or your email and signing up for things online. So by using a, an access like this, you avoid having any of the uh, miners try to log on to a system. Um, they're only using a username that you give them and a password. And it, it's a little bit jargon, but a headless device is a um, device that doesn't have a browser. So um, if you have an old, uh, like a Roku or Fire Stick or a smart TV, where you can't call up a window and type in an HTTP um, screen, but you can enter a username, just like at home, there's a, a, a security code, a, a 
WPA key for your, um, your cable modem. People are used to that. In this case, they're gonna enter a username and password from that screen and they can use these other uh, headless devices or devices that don't have a browser. Also works with, they call them IOT or Internet of Things devices. Now, you know, everything from a refrigerator to a vacuum cleaner has internet access built in. So it works for all of that. Um, the other thing, just kind of an anecdote for campgrounds, um, the triggered campaigns that I mentioned, smart campaigns, are so effective, but it's just something, if you're not used to thinking about it, you need to kind of brainstorm with Jody and, and her team on, on how to look at things a little differently. Um, as I mentioned, when uh, I grew up, we went camping every August and it was seasonal because of the lake froze over sometimes. Um, but every summer we'd go in August. So when I deal with a seasonal venue, we have some um, some venues down in Key West here um, and they're, they're Guest behavior is guests return about the same time every year. It's an annual thing. So what I would do is set up one of those triggered campaigns to send a message or several messages 11 months from now or 11 and a half months. So then that family is starting to think about their trip, their upcoming trip. And in their email or SMS, whichever you choose to use, they're getting a message or a reminder from you or a special. So you're top of mind as they're making the plans. And the best thing is that costs you nothing at that point in time to send it. You created the campaign when you set the service up, you set the system loose, it collected their email and automatically almost a year from now, they're gonna be reminded of the great time they had with you. And the other part of this is if you have special products or service and it doesn't apply just to campgrounds, um, it's important to think about, could they buy those products or services remotely? We had a, an ice cream chain that um, is up north and down here, and they're, they're typically in, in uh, tourism areas. And they're like, well, if, if, when we were talking to them, well, if they don't have um, one of our locations, what good would this do for us? But they happen to sell a hot fudge sauce that they bottled and shipped. And what a perfect thing. So you send a message to somebody four weeks after their vacation, say, hey, you remember when you visited us and you loved our ice cream? you know, come here to order your uh, hot fudge Sunday sauce sent to your home. So, you know, we're providing the tools and we have some best practices, but this is where Doty's team is the real pro at, you know, get maximizing the benefit from that. And it's a thinking outside the box. Great. Anything else? <clears throat> no, I think we're gonna go on to the next one. So we already talked about this, um, but, you know, I've gotten this question from some brick and mortar people with, you know, an actual store. Why not just use a basic router with a password? It's definitely not as secure as you think. Um, I know of definitely stores and restaurants that are wide open, which terrifies me. But even if you put the password on, as Eric mentioned before, people tend to make it an easy password to figure out. And it and once it's on there, it's on there for months, if not years. So you're sort of just asking for the network to be accessed potentially by the wrong people. Um, you're giving away free Wi-Fi that you're paying for and you're not collecting anything in return. You should be getting some, you, you should be leveraging that to get something back. Um, and then you're bypassing the opportunity to collect that information and, and use it as part of your marketing to learn about your audience, to create better campaigns. And lastly, an access point only works as well as the equipment allows it. Typically, a router that you go and buy at you know, Best Buy or Target, <clears throat> they're not very strong. You know, they may be good enough for your office or the downstairs of your house, but you're talking about a limited number of people using it. Whereas if you're trying to use that kind of a router for far more foot traffic, it's just, it's not powerful enough. Um, and that frustrates people even more. I mean, I know I've been on Wi-Fi networks, free Wi-Fi networks that I can't even get it to pull up my Instagram because the data, that the pictures take is, is eating it. <laughs> so, you know, it, these are the kinds of things to think about 
if you're going to ask this kind of, you know, do this kind of um, courtesy service. Eric, do you have anything else to share? Yeah, it kind of reminds me of if you're going to advertise on a radio station, you're going to make sure that you're advertising on the station that has the reach and the audience you want. So when you're picking out an access point, it's got to have the same it, it, the similar uh, characteristics. It's got to have the reach that you want. Um, and that's why we spent a little time talking about an LTE access point, which uses cell service, because it's different than a standard access point. But um, it's very true in that, um, you know, buy a, a, a access point that's designed for five users, and then you have 50 users, and you're going to have bottleneck and no one's going to be happy. Um, Bozone is uh, more or less hardware agnostic. And what we mean by that is we work with most brands of access points because we don't sell access points. We're a software company. We handle the solution um, from the access point on, but we have to integrate with those access points. So depending on how you want to use it um, helps determine which brand um, has the best uh, performance for you. So we quite frequently are on the phone with somebody who's getting ready to do this that wants some help. We'll talk to you about it. There's a tech team that uh, Jody works with that could help you with that as well. It yes. is important to pick out the right equipment, but, um, and you yeah. don't need to overpay. Um, also, you, just because uh, something costs more, there are features um, we had mentioned very early on, we use the term heat map um, and football. If you're trying to collect analytics, which we do, and you want to know how many people came, how many people stayed in that area for more than five minutes, how many people were the first visit. That's a fairly um, um, easy analytic to collect. But if you want to be able to say, you know, where did that person start when they entered our zone? Where did they go next and kind of draw out a map of where they've been? You need very specific data to be collected by the access point. And there's only a couple brands that actually do that. So it's uh, the old expression, begin with the end in mind. Uh, once we know what you're trying to achieve, we can make a better recommendation as well as Jody's team. Yep. Great. Thank you. So costs, what is my, why buy marketing costs? Um, I mean, we've touched, Eric was just touching on it, but equipment needs can be assessed through a site evaluation. Um, and that's definitely part of what Rural Solutions does. The site evaluation determines how much reach you'll need and how many access points you'll need to offer the kind of coverage that you want to offer. Um, as far as the, the software, GoZone is tiered to accommodate different levels of business. Um, for smaller venues, plans start at $300 annually or $30 a month. Um, and each additional Wi-Fi access point costs $250 annually or $25 a month. Um, the professional services fall under us. That's helping you with your marketing, looking at the analytics, figuring out what kind of campaigns to do, um, email marketing, social, pretty much all of those basics that are required to really make your business a success. Um, so that would be, you know, once you got going, you, we would work together and figure that out. Um, the great thing is, is that the Embrace grant is still available from the CBOEO and most, if not all of these kinds of services fall under that embrace grant, um, those guidelines. Eric, do you have anything else to add about the costs? No, I think that that's uh, pretty clear. And it's um, worth noting that during the uh, pandemic, we kind of had a uh, pivot point for our business when we started offering touchless menus in restaurants. And that type of service is included at that basic level of $30 a month. But even during the pandemic, um, when uh, if you were in a market that was open at all, even, you know, 50% occupancy or mask, et cetera, and we're, we're trying to do to go orders. Um, we found many, many businesses that um, found it very helpful to have that $30 a month plan to be able to broadcast a touchless menu and do some collection to find out which customers were still traveling and out and about. So um, 
I, I think uh, that's a great starting point. And uh, you know, I used to own my own restaurant and when I consider the, the marketing plans that I had at the time. Um, I think that's well within reach. Great. And this, I mean, this really leads me to, to, you know, potentially answer a question of, you know, what all can you do with the platform? It's really, there's a lot. Um, so it's a great platform. I mean, just Wi-Fi marketing generally really allows you to get pretty creative depending on your business. You can do everything from creating your business pers personas, which helps you understand your audience, to, as Eric has mentioned, triggered emails. Once they're set, you kind of set it and forget it in terms of, you know, all you do is you watch the information come back in. It's not even you. That would be something that we would do. Um, you know, especially for seasonal businesses, you have to capture, you, have, you know, half the year to capture a whole lot of people. Um, you know, so really there's just a world of creativity available to you, especially when you can marry the data. Um, you know, there is a saying in marketing that I happen to believe a lot, which is when you can marry your story with data, you, you kind of have this unbeatable combination. And that's what the Wi-Fi marketing allows you to do is capture that information to then go, okay, how is the best way to start campaigns that resonate with people? And that's really exciting and fun. Um, and it's just a great way to boost the business. Um, so there are some case studies available by market. You know, there's restaurant, outdoor recreation, gaming casino, resort hospitality, event convention center, and sports and entertainment. Um, I am happy to get you any of these if you're interested in taking a look. They're, they're not long. They're maybe one to three pages. Um, very simple to understand, but certainly helps explain um, in numbers, backed up by numbers, what Wi-Fi marketing did for um, these particular verticals. And questions. Fire away. <laughs> Jody, I, I have a I have a question. Um, I was thinking about the food trucks, right? And if you had a number of food trucks um, in in one spot, and say a number of them were offering this service, th does that ever become kind of an issue between the food trucks or or the people that are you know customers? Battle of the Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, which one should I go with, or you know. Um, actually, I'm going to default to Eric on that because that's definitely more on the technical side. What are your okay. thoughts on that, Eric? Good question. Well, there's uh, two parts to that. The first answer is uh, right now, as I mentioned, there's a window of opportunity that there aren't right. that many food trucks doing it. Um, the ones that are doing it today have the advantage. You can be that and have the advantage. But from a technical point of view, the next part of that is it depends on, on how close the signals are uh, to each other. So um, if the, you know, trucks are parked end to end versus, you know, stacked in, uh, that'll make a big difference. But if there are two um, wireless um, access points broadcasting within range, where the two overlap, depending on the brand and make and model you have, but most commercial grade are going to reduce the signal in that direction because they are directional. Many are omnidirectional, but that's still a direction. So, it's, you know, the, the where there's an interference each radio is going to try to broadcast weaker in that direction to minimize hmm. that. Um, also, depending on the access point, there are different channels they can broadcast on. Um, the same thing like in your home, if you're an apartment or condominium complex where there are a lot of people broadcasting Wi-Fi, um, if you have the, you know, you can download a free app that will tell you what channel you're on and you can switch the channel. So there are a couple things you can do uh, with that. But in general, um, if you're trying to provide service for, that you know everyone in, in that area which is great and if you have that opportunity do that all the time um but if you know your primary objective is to get your customers so that's going to be easy to do even if the truck next to you has the service right and honestly this is kind of a 
common sense thing that if if you are going to be a food truck offering and create Wi-Fi, like you want to have a sign right on the front there, you know, on both sides, so that when you're parked and people walk up to your window, you know, it should be right there, you know, saying, hey, we offer free Wi-Fi, look for this. Um, Absolutely. And that's even in brick and mortar businesses, we tell the restaurants yes. that because in a restaurant, people are used to asking what's the password. So they're going to say, hey, just look for Joe's Diner, whatever, you know, the, the right. name of that network is. And, you know, there's a, there's a, a, an anecdote we have. There are some businesses down in Key West along Duval, uh, was a real popular street there. And we were talking to this business and, and um, they were only putting their access points on their uh, porch. Uh, you know, you could drink in the in the uh, bar or they had an outdoor like on, along the sidewalk where you could drink and they put both of them they got directional antennas which had much longer range and put one at each end of the porch and, and broadcast down the block in both directions and they had this vast reach of people that they were collecting and getting messages and when you cast a broad net you may not get as a specific of market because they may not people that were interested in their their um you know their bar their business but their brand awareness went up and they did catch people that were would then come in so kind of the same thing in the food truck if you uh know your market uh, most food trucks that i've worked with you know have a, a route or a routine they go to these different stations you know and these events so they kind of know um let jody's team know what you know where it is you're you're going to be um selling food because you might get a different kind of radio that has greater reach specifically to catch more right yeah i mean it's just especially if you have a set route you can set up campaigns you know show up on wednesday between five and seven get a free drink um you know it, there's so many different things that you can do with that um again that's that's where the, the fun the creativity comes in um there's just you it's it's your business. And once we have an idea of, you know, what that audience looks like, it's, you know, it's let's brainstorm, let's put it together. If there's not another question waiting, I was going to talk a little bit more about the triggered campaigns. I have somebody? a question oh, actually. Okay. okay. Um, so my name is Ellen and I, I would be doing this mostly in outdoor recreation venues um, that are um, event-based. So like you go on a, a, a paddle and bike ride and then there's um kind of an event either at the beginning or at the finish line and a lot of these places are pretty remote so if you could speak a little bit more to how we would provide wi-fi access where there's not cell service and I, i'm thinking we would have to have sort of our access point in a place that does have cell service and then convey it to our event site or how, how would that work Great question. Thank you, Ellen. Ellen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot for that question. No, seriously, that is a great question. It's all you, um, Eric. <laughs> and we do a lot of remote events. So um, the answer really varies a lot depending on, on where and, and how how to get Wi-Fi there. So there are, um, we work with a variety of partners that specialize in this sort of, of thing. So there are point to point uh, systems that they can use that they can go to, you know, a place miles away and, and, and uh, send a signal to a receiver in that area. Um, a lot of times uh, when we do like, uh, we do uh, some events that have uh, bike races um, and some of the, the marathon type, you know, not the brand name, but, you know, runs like that where they're in areas that don't have good service. So there will often be um, uh, internet service brought in for the event. Some of our, our very large shows are some of the in-water boat shows, the international boat shows, and um, there's not good access uh, over the water, um, which there could be, but there's not there. So for that event, for a 10-day show, they bring in a circuit specifically for that event. Um, and it really depends on how big the event is, right? How many people, are, and, and, and there's a cost benefit analysis you'd have to do and say, okay, it would cost X to bring in this bandwidth. Is it worth it for my marketing? Um, so I, I don't mean to be evasive. It's just, it, it really depends. It, it could be a temporary, um, temporary service. We have a, a variety of partners that just do pop-up events and some are, are planned events in, you know, fairgrounds and in, in fields and, um, that's typically the way they do it if they can't do a point-to-point -point service. 
Right. And Great. Just, that makes sense. Thanks. And Ellen, our CEO, CTO is on top of that stuff. So Great. Um, yeah, he, he couldn't be here today, but that's totally his wheelhouse. He would be looking to see how we could best make sure you had the, the bandwidth that you needed. There are even satellite solutions, um, and with the broad, you know, launching of all the different satellites every couple of months, there's more all the time. But there are some, you know, at, it, at one period in time, there's a very esoteric uh, thing. But now, um, the costs have come down, the latency is down. Uh, there's a lot more benefits. So there's there's a lot of way to get uh, uh, internet to remote places now. Thanks, Eric. Thanks. I've got one and... more question here okay. um, i don't know if you can answer this but you were speaking to say like the the restaurants earlier and i think you were using new moon as an example and and, and how you can limit um patrons usage and i'm, and I'm curious um uh, do you see restaurants doing that and how does a, a restaurant or a venue like that um approach that so they don't get you know, an upset right. client or, or a bad review that kind of works against their whole reason for offering the Wi-Fi in the first place? Well, Go ahead. I, I think the first thing to do, I mean, when you're letting people know that you have free Wi-Fi, it needs to be, you know, there needs to be some copy there on a sign, you know, saying, hey, the first half hour is free. After that, you know, either they're paying for it or, you know, you're going to have to use your data. I mean, it's all about communication. I also think it's dependent on the actual type of venue. Coffee shops, we know, or, pe or places that are sort of coffee-esque, people will hang out in them for hours. I mean, I was at Crew Coffee for two hours yesterday just working. Um, you know, if, if you're talking about fine dining or more of, you know, like a Sweetwaters, I probably wouldn't kick those people off because typically, you know, they're either, they're eating, sitting down and eating dinner. So at most they're there, maybe an hour and a half. You have a lot of turnover. Um, that's my two cents about it. Eric, what are your thoughts? Lots of options, but uh, in terms of what we see, um, it's so dependent on the type of restaurant, like you just mentioned, right. um, virtually, uh, I'll say all, but most of the restaurants that we work with have some limits in place, uh, particularly bandwidth limits, um, to make sure that that uh, is more efficient to get more users on. And uh, many of them have time uh, time of day, you know, access, if you will, that they're available. And then in terms of uh, knocking a person off, it, that varies dramatically. We don't see many um, with a very short 15 or 30 minute window, um, except in areas where that's common, like the UK. I, I've got more places in London where you literally pay for your service with your purchase <laughs> and, and there's no bones about it. You know, here's your voucher, you want another voucher, buy another cup of coffee. Um, but that's not common here. So um, where I have seen is right on the splash page where you sign up, say, hey, welcome to Fred's Diner. Um, we're providing you with a complimentary 30 minutes of Wi-Fi exactly what I would do, or one minute, or I'm sorry, one hour of Wi-Fi. And then you can be creative about what happens at the end of that time. Um, it could be as simple as I, I kind of mentioned, it just does, you know, says, okay, you need to re-log on. Um, and now they're, once they've done that, if they've logged in one time, they don't need to provide that same in information in a second or subsequent visit, right? So if you're collecting an email when they first arrive, we build a guest profile around that guest. That's what our marketing for Wi-Fi platform does. And it starts with the address of that device, whether it's phone or tablet, whatever it is. And then throughout their history of using a service, um, the information is tied back to that device address. So that, that guest profile um, uh, has all the information about their visit, and we know how they logged in that first time. So when they come back, instead of saying, please give us your email, it says, welcome back, Joe, please click to connect. So that same experience would happen to them if, if you had 30 minutes in a coffee shop. And again, it depends. Are you a Starbucks that's looking to turn people quickly, you know, or are you a coffee, you know, if you're Panera that they've got, uh, you know, charging stations all over so you can lay out your laptop. 
you know, they're going to have it longer. But whether it's 30 minutes or an hour, you're going to be asked to log back in. You can say on that return message, hey, um, Joe, uh, thanks for checking back in. Um, we're going to offer another 30 minutes. We're going to offer another hour, um, you know, for your use today so that they see it right on their phone or their device. And, and so I think it's less um, uh, insulting than it could be just a text. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, does that kind of address? Yeah, it does. Thank you. And we have some coffee shops, that particularly early on, that that um, were afraid that by offering the the free Wi-Fi that it would uh, make their guests stay too long. You know, and, and their business model was just give them that cup and go. They, you know, they didn't want somebody. So you know, there's different strokes for different folks. Uh, but in that case, you ought to be collecting that information so you could be sending them um, right. flyers, right, about how to get by their uh, custom grounds and all that. Pacific, do you have a question? Yes, um, thank you, Erica and, and Jody for presenting. And my question is, um, are there any legal implication for collecting people's data in this manner where you're collecting people's data without, uh, maybe I, I'm thinking, are there any consent that people have to sign before they give consent to their data? How does that work? Um, I'll say something quick and then I'll turn it over to Eric. Typically there is a disclaimer that basically says, you know, by you using the service or logging in, you're allowing us to collect your data. I, I'm really glad you asked that question because uh, you gave me an opportunity to, to mention that. It's one more reason why you shouldn't just buy a router at your local electronic store and throw it out there. Um, right. Yes, there are legal ramifications if you're broadcasting a Wi-Fi signal and collecting personally identifiable information and mishandling that. So you want to do it carefully. Um, our system does deliver a terms and conditions, which um, we cover when you first work with Jody. That's one of the things that, that you would review. We offer a boilerplate, uh, which is a good starting point, and then you can add additional things um, as you see fit. Um, one of the things that you agreed to do is not to sell that data. So our system is, is compliant and is built in with tools so you can be compliant. You turn around and export that list and sell it to somebody, you're in violation. So a part of it is, is how you handle or, or mishandle that data and that information. Um, from our end, we are um, back-end compliant to make sure we're uh, meeting GDPR and CASEL compliance or a number of codes in different countries uh, that apply to this and, and how you have to handle PII information. If you have a restaurant or anyone that's taking credit cards, you need to be PCI compliant for your credit card business. Um, so we're, we're aware of those and have addressed those and happy to talk to you about them. But if you're in an area that's more sensitive, particularly some of the casinos have found this, uh, depending on their, their state gaming laws, which vary dramatically from state to state, um, there are some that are more um, uh, strict, not so much in the use, but at how you present it. So we have both opt-in and opt-out options. It can be right on the splash page. And the difference is you can have a presumptive opt-in that says, um, I, I agree to the terms and conditions with a little checkbox that's already pre-filled. That's an opt-in. You're assuming they're going to, I'm sorry, they'd have to opt out and uncheck if they didn't want it. So. We have lots of ways to address that, and that's a couple of them. One other tool that uh, doesn't get asked about very often, but um, guests whose information you've collected have the right to have you uh, report to them where that data has been sent and also to have you delete that data. So right in our dashboard, we have uh, commands to, to handle that. You can uh, create a report of where that data has been used. You can uh, delete all that data. You can send that. So we make it easy for you to comply. Great, thank you, Eric. Thank you. And, and I'm gonna say, there's also a, a content filtering. Um, you know, if, if you wanna make sure that uh, inappropriate sites aren't available and that's kind of a whole nother topic, but that is available. Um, <laughs> so that, that can be covered as well. Any other questions? Yeah, one more question. Um, I am wondering if you guys have ever been approached by like a, a marketer to provide the internet 
uh, to these businesses and using the data as a way to market to, pe to people. I'm just wondering if anybody has ever approached you to do that. And um, nobody's approached me, um, Eric. Let me make sure I understand. So um, you're saying uh, that the business would provide the internet access, meaning pay for the, um, the internet service to the business in exchange for the data? Exactly. Um, I, I wouldn't um, be able to comp, yeah. I would have to run that by somebody other than me to find out if that would be permissible um, because yeah. the data can't be sold. So right. um, to me, that just on the surface sounds like that would, would be a, a problem. Um, but I, I'm, so no one's ever asked me either. Um, but there are lots of ways to work with marketers and advertisers. We really didn't touch on advertising. Um, and it wasn't the topic here. Um, but our platform um, also has the abil ability to deliver, to manage ads. We have a Wi-Fi network here, the campground. They see a splash page. When they, you know, the first thing they see when they connect to that network is, you know, welcome to our campground. You could have an ad right on that page. It could be um, stationary, a still ad, or it could be a video. It could be take link to another website, and uh, or destinations. Cross promotions are huge like this. We have um, a menu that has a lodge in a beautiful setting uh, in the Grand Canyon. And they also have an attraction uh, nearby. They're owned by the same group. And um, they used to market those separately. And so now through Wi-Fi, when you're in the lodge, you see ads for the attraction. And when you're in the attraction, you see ads for the lodge. Um, so it's just hand in glove. Um, another example, we worked with a business that um, Trying to think how specific I can be. Um, they they handled a ferry terminal um, that took people to a destination, and um, they were um, mainly promoting, um, you know, buying ferry tickets and return tickets and specials. And after talking through with us and kind of bouncing ideas, they changed their promotions to be for um, attractions at the destination. So there's there's lots of ways to work with marketers. Um, and you know, Jody, work with Jody. <laughs> You're all there. Um, but there are ways to um, to get those desired results. But I don't know that we could just trade the data for um, for the um, access. All right. Thank you, mm -hmm. Jody. If I can say something about uh, guest Wi-Fi marketing in general, we've covered you know a lot yeah. about campgrounds and food trucks and restaurants. Um, Whatever business that you're in or wherever you're thinking about this, we, we like to think of guests anywhere that there's guest Wi-Fi is an opportunity to collect data that could be helpful. Um, some of our clients are actually funeral homes. And when they, uh, we didn't approach, the, uh, the first one that came to us, they approached us and was like, you know, we were trying to figure out the use case there, but um, a lot of people are there for the showing hours and visitations and they're there for a period of time and they're there with family and they wanted access. And the funeral home said, you know, this is how we build our marketing list. We want to be subtle and inobtrusive. Um, car dealerships are huge. Um, stadiums, um, just anywhere where there are people, uh, uh, car repair shops, tire stores, you're, you're there for a period of time while you're getting your cars checked or your tires checked. Um, anywhere that people might want Wi-Fi. So it's kind of a different way of uh, looking um, at Wi-Fi marketing. And the, the follow-on to that for the triggered campaigns is we didn't talk about a lot of these. We talked about some, but um, the triggers can be based on their number of visits. So you could send a frequent guest email after seven visits or X visits, whatever uh, visit. Could include a coupon if you believe in coupons. If you don't, it doesn't have to. Um, it could be on their birthday. That's another trigger that's in there. We also have some presence triggers. Um, I won't get into the details much, but uh, when somebody returns to your um, business, it, even if they don't log into Wi-Fi, um, if their device is with them and turned on, it will report to our system. So you can even send triggered campaigns to people that have come back multiple times that didn't check in, which is kind of novel. And the one that I like the best, having been a restaurant tour, is the lost business where you can set a trigger. If the guest has not returned within X days, send this message. 
when I had uh, my restaurant here in Florida, um, we knew that, you know, our, our, our typical loyal guests or frequent guests came about every four to six weeks. They didn't come every month, not quite, but, you know, more frequently than every other month, roughly, you know, and we just kind of knew this from talking to our guests and knowing. So I would have set my trigger at six weeks. If I haven't seen them in six weeks or eight weeks, I want to send a message. Hey, this is Eric. Uh, we appreciate all the times you've been. We haven't seen you in a while. Why don't you come in and get a piece of dessert on me? That sort of thing. So it's lots of triggers and we can't cover them all, but Jody does. <laughs> so if you have questions later, uh, make sure you reach out to her. Thanks, Jody. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Well, my information, uh, contact info is in the chat. Um, I know Simeon and Rachel well. So if you aren't able to reach me by email, feel free to reach out to them. Um, and again, thanks so much for attending. Um, we're glad to have you and we're happy to bring this tool to Vermont and everybody else. Jody, Eric, I'd just like to thank you so much for taking the time to present information and share on this really interesting topic. Uh, so thank you very much for taking the time and um, you know, presenting on this. So. Of course. You're, you're welcome, it was fun. <laughs> and I'm 